Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining today's Geospatial Fellows webinar. I'm Xiaowen Wang from the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. I'm serving as the director of the CyberGS Center for Advanced Digital and Spatial Studies that organizes this Geospatial Fellows webinar series in partnership with the AAG, UCGIS, OGC, and the North at the University of Chicago. We would like to acknowledge the support by the National Science Foundation for the Geospatial Fellows Program. And I'd like to extend my uh, many thanks to uh, several colleagues, including uh, Dr. Colin Doni at AAG, uh, Aline at AAG as well, and uh, Dr. Anand Padmanabhan and uh, Becky Vanderwally at UIUC for uh, helping run this webinar series smoothly. Now with my uh, great honor and pleasure, I'd like to introduce uh, today's uh, speakers. We have two uh, terrific speakers, uh, Dr. Andrew Greenlee and uh, Dr. Ruby Mendelhall. Uh, Dr. Greenlee is a professor uh, in the Department of Ge uh, Urban Planning, Urban and Regional Planning at UIUC. Uh, his research lies at the intersection of housing policy, poverty, and uh, social equity within cities and uh, regions. His uh, talk today is titled uh, Translating Knowledge into Action, the Effect of Eviction moratoria on the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Uh, Ruby Mendenhall is a professor of uh, sociology, African-American studies, urban and regional planning, gender and women's studies, and the social work at UIUC. Um, she's also associate dean for diversity and the democratization of health innovation at the Carl Illinois College of Medicine. Her research examines how living in racially segregated neighborhoods with high levels of violence affects Black women's mental and physical health. So uh, her talk today is uh, titled Lessons Learned and Not Learned, Chicago's Death Inequalities During the 18, 1918 Flu and uh, COVID-19. So today we will go with uh, Dr. Mendenhall's team's talk first. Uh, without further ado, let's pass the Zoom floor to, uh, to Ruby. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for the fellowship and the opportunity to um, look at this question um, with the Geospatial Fellowship. And I'll share my slides. And I want to um, thank the geospatial team um, and several of them will be presenting today. And, and one thing I love about being at the University of Illinois and I guess there's other places too, just the level of interdisciplinary research that you can do. And so in terms of the talk outline, I'll talk a little bit about the youth citizens or community scientists mapping project, which we're um, built into this. And then also um, 400 years of racial trauma, right? Kind of thinking about African-Americans, their experience in the US and then as they migrated, um, what happened during the um, 1918 pandemic and then um, kind of what we're seeing for COVID-19. And then um, we have um, students from um, students and postdoc from Brown University who will talk about digitizing, digitizing the maps from um, 1918 and then also some of the um, preliminary analysis that we've done We're still I'm um, kind of in the process of this study. And then we'll talk about next steps too. So in terms of the Youth Citizen Scientist Mapping Project, um, it's part of the STEM Illinois NOVO Project. And um, part of that really is this intergenerational outreach and education and arguing as we try to have students involved in computer science or geography or medicine or any field, especially those students who are on the margins of society, that it really does take the mother, uncle, sister, brother, cousin to support them and to ensure that they're successful along the way. So um, even as we um, do activities and events, we try to think about the parents and the broader um, community. And um, also part of it is to also have them understand um, space, right? While well, talk about space and race and how that plays out um, in terms of pandemics and other um, social determinants of health. And um, as this project, we also want to understand what are some of the um, consequences of COVID-19? We're hearing a lot about long haulers and um, also that's part of the citizen scientist project. Like how do you get ordinary people who are 
um, witnessing a, an event to um, give their input, to give you more knowledge about what's happening. And so one way that we're training them is through our community health workers um, training program, Morehouse College of Medicine. They have a great online program for high school students. And so we just started that. I think we're in, we just finished week two of introducing that to the students. And the goal really is for the young people to create tools to decrease the sp uh, spread and impact of COVID-19, whether it's infographics, whether it's um, workbooks, art for public awareness campaign, data visualizations. Um, we're hoping to train them how to digitize um, some of the maps so they'll also have that skill. And then this map here is um, when we first started, our team um, talked about, we were trying to figure out how do we introduce students to the Cyber GISX platform. And we talked about just having them start with what they know very well, and that is mapping their community. So that's just an um, image of one of the examples that students did. And then we, um, um, Rebecca did an amazing um, training. She created a workbook that took the students um, step by step by step through um, the Cyber GISX system so that they're able to create maps. And then this is one example. And so what we try to do, again, bring it in the community, we hit a megathon and ask them, so what things, right, do you feel your uh, community would benefit we're in the midst of COVID, what do you think is needed? And then this was just one example of someone who felt that um, wooden boxes um, throughout the neighborhood um, would help seniors get masks. And this was the time when um, we were all concerned about the seniors going out and being exposed. And, um, and then they actually mapped that using the system. And um, so we were, as I said before, we were hoping to have some of the students I'm here, um, one of them is on a college tour and um, can't be a part of it, but the students are in our meetings and they are hearing us go back and forth. Even they're hearing me say, okay, um, what is this? Okay, so, so what's the code? Like, how do you do it? And I do that because I want them to be very comfortable with being in spaces where you don't know the answer, being in spaces where you may have to slow the group down to make sure that you understand it so that you can um, use that information as well. And then, um, so I talked about um, the, the 1918 influenza, also COVID-19, and the larger setting is um, 400 years for African-American communities, right? Um, other groups have their own history, but 400 years of racial trauma and how that creates these um, social determinants of health that makes groups um, more vulnerable to pandemics that occur. And this image here is of my grandmother who was at a um, talk with Dr. King. And this is her sister. When she was younger, she took care of her grandmother who was an enslaved human. And her grandmother told her stories and she told me those stories. And I use this picture to show that um, slavery in US history is fairly recent and that it was only one person between an enslaved human and myself who told those stories. And I also say, um, use it to say that those um, impacts of racial trauma, both historically and currently are still playing out. And that's some of the science that we want to capture. That's some of the science that we want to use to disrupt um, the excess death that we see from pandemics and um, even before COVID, just from social determinants of health. And then I also um, put Tulsa up here too, and that again, um, this, um, these historical events around trauma that they still play out and they still affect health and wellness in the black community. And then here, um, it's just kind of it spilled out more um, individuals where they live, their environment, the political economic part of it is part of the social determinants of health, their identity um, related to race, gender, sexuality, um, the position, um, me as a professor versus a student, right? The power and the access that we have to resources also influence health and well wellness. And then all these other things, right? Where you live could affect your basic needs in terms of your ability to get fresh water, such as Flint, Michigan. Um, it could affect access to healthcare. So always thinking about, um, even as we look at these pandemics in terms of the implications, 
But then when we want to think about prevention, how do we think about um, providing access to employment, to healthcare, to um, some of those other social determinants? And this is um, just the image too around, um, um, I'm grateful to the medical students, Samantha and Kanisha, um, as we do our research, we try to make it accessible. Again, this idea of the community, we want um, individuals in the community to understand what we're saying, what the science, what our um, findings show. And basically we're just trying to, um, we already talked about the poverty, the unemployment, discrimination, but then also um, adverse childhood experiences, right? What young people are exposed to that could also be driven by social determinants affect their health and wellness um, later in life. And um, we tried to create this cartoon to make it very explicit that when the stress, you know, um, sometimes stress is good, you have the resources to um, address it. And then that's kind of healthy, your body can um, process it. But sometimes when it's chronic, um, it's relentless, um, then it tends to um, wear and tear, have wear and tear on the body. And that's when we talk to individuals in the community about um, our research that sometimes is complex. This is a way that we try to break it down. And so our research questions. So um, were descendants of slaves and other Blacks living in Chicago vulnerable to excess death during the 1918 influenza? Over 100 years later, were they um, vulnerable to COVID-19? And then what were some of the, if so, what were some of the driving factors of this vulnerability? And then, oops, sorry, what lessons can we learn to prevent um, the excess death in future um, epidemics and pandemics and um, even just related to social determinants of health? And um, this is just an um, article that talked about um, the 1918 flu and how the factors that kind of played out were um, unemployment, age, and other things. But when we went to try to see what was the role of race, um, that wasn't captured as well. So then what comes next is kind of our attempt to look at it um, um, based on race and space and then compare it to COVID-19. So I'll turn it over to Melina who um, got us started on this process. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mendenhall. Um, hi everyone, I'm Melina. I'm a rising senior at Brown University. Um, and my role in this project was to digitize the 1918 flu maps of Chicago that came from a report published in 1919 titled, A Report of an Epidemic of Influenza in Chicago Occurring During the Fall of 1918. Um, this report contains seven maps total spanning from the first week of October to mid-November. Um, and the map shown in the slide here depicts the map of week four, which was the week ending in October 26, 1918. Um, and this week showed the highest number of influenza deaths with the legend um, in the bottom left corner reporting 1,499 deaths. And it reports the second highest number of pneumonia deaths um, at 789 deaths. Um, and so over the seven weeks, the first few, the first two weeks um, had much lower number of deaths um, and weeks three through five showed the heaviest and then six and seven um, showed less deaths. Um, and so I started the, um, with maps that were geo-referenced by Zhang, who will speak after me. Um, and he overlaid the current street polyline on the maps um, in ArcGIS. Next slide, please. Um, so continuing in ArcGIS, I used the point edit function. Um, and this allowed me to individually mark each death for influenza and for pneumonia. Um, and to clearly distinguish between the two, I digitized influenza deaths as purple circles, as shown on the left, um, and for the pneumonia deaths, digitize them as orange circles, shown on the right. Um, and so using these two bright and opposite colors, it made it very easy to see both deaths and where they occurred all over the map. Um, and this process was repeated individually for the seven maps. Um, in terms of results, the map for week one was the only map where the total number of deaths reported in the legend equal the total number of deaths that I digitized. Um, the maps for weeks two through seven, um, I happened to digitize less deaths than the total um, number of deaths that were reported in the legend, um, which brings me to some of the limitations that I encountered and that we discussed as a team. Um, 
And so again, the original report these that these maps came from did not include specific details about the deaths. Um, in the one page description that talked about the maps, um, the most detail showed was discussing the legend and how closed dots represented influenza deaths and how open circles represented pneumonia deaths, um, but there was no more specific detail um, about each death point. Um, and so we discussed some reasons as a team as to why the total number of reported deaths do not equal the total number of deaths that were digitized. Um, one potential reason is the possibility that the death points do not account for multiple deaths that happened in one location, such as deaths, multiple deaths that may have occurred in just one family living in one area. Um, another reason is the confusion of some of the points on the original map. Um, some appear to be half open, half closed, and that's unclear whether it was intentional. So maybe if it was intentional, it counted for both an influenza and pneumonia death, um, or if it was unintentional, how to distinguish whether they meant it as an influenza or a pneumonia death. Um, and another limitation we discussed was the lack of race specific information for any of the influenza and pneumonia deaths that were recorded on the map. Um, which caused us to look into other sources such as the 1910 or 1920 census to get a gauge on the racial demographics um, in Chicago during this time. Um, so with that, that was my main role um, in this project. Thank you all for listening. And now I'll pass it to John to discuss his methods and findings. Hi, uh, yeah, my name, I, I'm John Shaxin and I'm uh, also a postal researcher at Brown. So mostly, most of my role is that to using the data set uh, that we cre uh, create by the digitizing and uh, georeferencing, we try to figure out the, the previous research question, how was the, the racial uh, uh, differentiation uh, disparity in the 1990 pand uh, 1980 pandemic or at least in COVID-19. So to do this, uh, actually my slide is more animated, so can you click? Yeah, so we, Firstly, we doing some georeferencing and digitizing based on the previous uh, 1980 influenza and pneumonia map. And also for the, the racial information, we also using the 1920 black neighborhood in Chicago uh, census track map, which is both are based on the census track level data set. And recently to compare with the COVID-19 pandemic, we also using publicly available health data from the uh, Chicago area. Uh, typically they have a more small list of geographic units of zip code. So we get the zip code level COVID-19 deaths in Chicago and also the racial uh, po uh, po uh, population of the uh, Black and African-American in, uh, in Chicago at the level of the zip code level analysis. Uh, based on that, we're doing some mapping for the, some summary statistics or and some animation to see the trend, how, how the, this hotspot, or uh, we also do the hotspot analysis and also do some animate map to see the trend, how the hotspot is moving around in the certain the seven weeks of a period in the 1980 influenza. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this one is the initial research. So basically, the the right 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 side of map red the the red color sham. Uh, represent about the influenza deaths during the nine, total seven weeks period and each of census uh, each, each census track level and the right side blue map uh, blue color gem map is for the pneumonia deaths so obviously it's more concentrated in the central area but we perform the additional analysis which is a hotspot analysis to where is the most hot uh, most the hottest part uh, part of the uh, influenza and pneumonia deaths in this period. So left side maybe is left side is the influenza, right side is the pneumonia. And we also do the, do the some historical map. So no, can you I'll go back? Okay. Yeah. Go back a little. Oops. Okay. Yeah. So base we also have a, this historical map. This is also kind of low resolution of map image, but we using this image, we also do the georeferencing and we figured it out the certain census tract, which is more than more than 50% of uh, black and African American population in uh, world living. So based on this area, we try to figure it out how this, the 
black neighborhood, the black dominant neighborhood in 1980 and black dominant neighborhood in, in COVID-19, how their difference between the, these two. So this is for the 19, uh, 1920 census tract information. So based on this bounce, uh, they were, they were the boundary, uh, click just one, click once. Oh no, just one more click, oh, next. Oh, yeah, next. Is that it? Oh, no, 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 I mean the next slide. Okay, my sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so we figured it. Uh, we were we were able to figure it out. Where is actually the the black majority uh neighbor uh, neighborhood in the in the area of Chicago? So based on this, we will still keep working on how to compare it uh, directly compare with the uh, left map. Left side of my map is the uh, mortality rate in the COVID nineteen in uh, zip code level in Chicago. So we based this also using the uh, fifty percent of a uh, black and African American population to identify the black neighborhood. So based on this uh, comparison, we want we want to do the more additional analysis for the to address the research question in the first. And yeah, this is the kind of animation map is the which is a total seven weeks of, of period in the in nineteen eighty. So how where is the most central more central area more hotspot associated with the, the black uh, neighborhood in the 1980s so this is a current our current current working on it and we will do some further analysis to do address the initial research test great thank you and then just um closing next steps um again we're training community health workers to think about race and space um we have an organization that prepared a natural and man-made disaster plan. So they will be um, working on that and as trusted and um, trusted members of the community, hopefully they'll know what to do in the case of something else, or even as we see the variants kind of um, start to take hold. And then also I'm wondering with this group, right? Like if it's possible to get like a library of the variables as we start to look at the COVID analysis and to think about the vulnerabilities. Um, and then, right, so we're uh, creating a regular Jupyter notebook, but also thinking about a junior one where young people would be able to follow step by step. That's something we're thinking. We don't know if we will be able to do something like that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ruby. Um, Marina and John for this uh, very interesting sharing, uh, quite uh, quite interesting work. Um, you've got several questions in the Q and A box. As we transition to Andrew's talk, you can start looking at those questions. So now, um, Andrew, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I, I uh, think this is really going to be. Um, a great compliment. These are kind of very different um, modalities of working, but I think there's some really interesting tie-ins, particularly when we're talking about uh, questions of uh, racial trauma and disparate impacts, and also talking about uh, questions of excess deaths. So I think we'll start to see the connections and some of the ways in which this opens up some other conversations. The other area that I think we'll see this is around the question of broadening a, um, a user base or a base of individuals to be in conversation uh, around uh, around this work. So uh, I, I'm excited. I'm excited to uh, get to the Q and A portion. So I'll try to be brief with the presentation. Um, before I get into this, it's important for me to share just a bit of my background. I, I'm, for the most part, I'm a, an expert in housing policy. My work has primarily focused in the area of spatial dimensions of residential mobility, um, both moving or being forced to change residences. And so this work, for the most part, is focused on program evaluation, especially with our nation's uh, public housing and low-income uh, housing stock and, uh, and programs, um, but has also sought to look at other types of transformative moments uh, like the nation's foreclosure crisis, as I said before, public housing transformation, and more generally uh, to understand some of the diverse trajectories of uh, 
both uh, individual residential movement, but then also collective tra uh, trajectories that we might describe as neighborhood change. So how do I get from there into questions of, uh, of COVID? Well, um, for me, this has come out of uh, an interesting uh, partnership with uh, other researchers, uh, primarily folks working in epidemiology, uh, computational uh, biology. We initially start off to ask questions about residential living environments and around um, socio-spatial uh, impacts of uh, not related to COVID. We were um, doing research on uh, bed bugs, in fact, and the ways that bed bugs create traumatic relationships for tenants, change economic relationships between tenants and landlords, and the like. And when uh, the COVID pandemic hit, um, we decided to um, refocus some of our lens into uh, the area of uh, COVID. But surrounding this for me uh, are some observations that come from how um, we've thought about how our nation has dealt with uh, crisis and instability in housing, particularly thinking back now around 80 years to, um, to a prior uh, crisis moment coming off of uh, the, the Great Depression. Some of the characteristic observations uh, regarding that moment, but then also the, the current moment now are these. We see continued and mounting cost burdens, especially for low-wage workers, single parents, female-headed households, and the elderly. We see an undersupply of units that are targeted towards our most unstable low-income households. We see a severe mismatch between supply and demand, especially in some of our nation's largest cities. And we see deep precarity that's characterizing not only the predicament of tenants, um, but as uh, many have also pointed out, uh, characterize the predicaments of uh, landlords and uh, property owners. So the question then becomes, how do these failures, what do these look like with regards to questions related to COVID? It's an interesting moment for us to be uh, talking about this. Uh, housing instability isn't just a result of COVID, but is rather also a secondary effect of the extraordinary measures that we've taken to stem its spread, including the National Eviction Moratorium. Um, as, we're, um, as we're talking now, um, I thought it was important to put up a little calendar here. We're just days away from the expiration of the federal eviction moratorium, which is going to potentially expose millions of Americans to the threat of eviction, uh, just as we're also starting to contend with um, broader questions around the continued spread of COVID and especially the renewed threat um, that's posed by uh, the Delta uh, variant. So in this policy moment, uh, we really don't know exactly what's going to happen to those households facing the most severe housing instability when the moratorium lifts. Uh, federal rental assistance funds are earmarked to help to relieve tenants and also their landlords, but those funds are not likely to reach most people who are in need uh, before this weekend. States are moving with different levels of aggression to uh, distribute those funds and likewise tenant advocates uh, and uh, tenant support um, is highly driven by local political climates and attitudes towards the federal assistance itself. So we have a, some major questions around unevenness right now. The consequences of extending the moratorium are um, kind of bottom line, increasingly great, uh, both as legal challenges, particularly from real estate and landlord groups, continue to accumulate um, at all levels of the court system, all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, but the consequences for renters, many of whom have not received assistance are also as great. So this kind of provides some current context and we, we've had this moment several times now over the course of the pandemic where we've been faced with um, what will happen when the eviction moratorium expires, what's likely to happen to individuals. And that really has guided the work that we've done uh, over uh, the last year, some of which I'm going to try to summarize uh, today. Um, in talking about this, before I go on, it's absolutely essential that, um, that I just underscore the point that the consequences that we're talking about here are not equally spread amongst the renter population and that while the situation has improved, certainly from this winter, uh, it's been really challenging to move the needle on hardship over the course of this pandemic. Uh, housing instability still remains a fact of life for one in seven renters and also a substantial portion of homeowners who have benefited from uh, foreclosure moratoria as well. 
Taking a step back from the headlines and grave social and economic policy concerns, the pandemic has opened up a new terrain for a conversation about housing inequity. The visibility of this inequity vis-a-vis -vis the lens of public health is allowing the housing policy community to gain traction through more effective policy in a way that was simply ignored prior to the pandemic or in making arguments on the merits of this would be beneficial from a housing perspective. Public health has really changed that conversation uh, substantially in the public health questions. Uh, the questions on the minds of many housing policy researchers and advocates is how to rebuild around a housing system that's fairer, more equitable, and that does not sow its own seats for the next crisis. Uh, from my perspective as a community member, interdisciplinary geospatial approaches are really at the core of how we make these points and create more effective policy debate and action. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the type of collaboration that I've been participating in and what's uh, resulted. So first off, before I go any further, I have to say I could not do any of this alone. There is a whole team uh, behind uh, this work. I particularly want to acknowledge and call out the leadership and contributions of my fellow co-PIs, Allison Hill, Michael Levy, and Daniel Schneider, as well as the whole team that has really contributed uh, to this work. Again, the, the, the core team here, we started off as bed bug modelers and uh, have moved now into this whole, the whole COVID-19 world. So our primary goal has been to build upon the common SEIR model that's used frequently in infectious disease modeling to reflect on some of the particular dynamics of COVID infections. Uh, the diverse patchwork of federal, state, and local and institutional mitigation strategies have made it really challenging to adequately inform these types of models. Uh, focusing specifically on the question of how social distancing and residential stability might play a role in altering the spread of COVID, we sought not only to fill in what you see here as the legs of this elephant, um, using available data coming primarily from uh, medical community, but also to begin to examine the variations in the elephant's habitat and surroundings and how those matter. So that's what I'm going to fill in for the most part today. Uh, going beyond these first order infection dynamics has been really challenging. It's been really hard to count these things. Uh, for any of you who are familiar with housing policy work or work related to evictions, you'll note that with one major exception, that being the work of uh, Eviction Lab, uh, there's very little standardized avail uh, available data about evictions themselves, and, and even more so when we're looking at questions of what is happening after evictions, there is next to no evidence aside from a few panel studies that describe what actually happens to households after they're evicted. So this becomes a really important thing for us to think about in terms of our approach to modeling. Um, we assume that the population consists of individuals who begin housed, and then over the course of the pandemic, they may either remain housed or may face forms of economic and social instability, like eviction or displacement, that might cause them to double up, essentially leaving their primary residence and moving in with other people, with friends or family or, or unrelated people. Um, or they might end up moving into a congregate housing situation, essentially uh, a shelter. So we use this, these, this kind of set of assumptions to inform a model that uh, then uh, kind of reflects the fact that we know that COVID for the most part spreads primarily due to close contact. So we take a network-based approach to doing this modeling, treating individuals and households as a form of social network. Then our model structure social distancing causes breaks in some existing networks as people distance and limit their contacts with others. Um, but then countering those breaks and connections, housing instability and evictions can cause these forms of doubling up, which increases the size of, the size of households and also the rates of uh, contact for those within households, right? So the actual, the actual individual risk of being in contact uh, with someone who's been exposed to COVID then alters as a result of the doubling up um, at the household level. So what this looks like from a modeling perspective, um, here's a hypothetical 
city or metro area with a million person network um, in the period prior to the, to the pandemic. And then we use reasonable assumptions um, that, we get, uh, that we get from available data to show what that network then looks like after social distancing and also after doubling up occurs. So it gives you a sense of kind of what's going on uh, from a computational uh, perspective. So to talk about the results, I'm actually going to I'm going to pull push the easy button to talk about results. I'm going to rely upon the um, CDC's most uh, recent um, most recent um, justification for extending the the moratorium. Uh, this was issued in June and extends the moratorium through the end of uh, this month. And we were very fortunate enough that our work was actually cited as evidence to um, to extend the moratorium. And so um, the argument here is uh, primarily that um, there's a heightened risk of infection for those households uh, that are evicted. But in addition to that, there's a collective risk that's described uh, by um, the types of random contacts that we have in navigating our cities and regions. So, um, so eviction moratoria are actually important, not just because of individual risks, but they also have important benefits in terms of mitigating collective risks to individuals who might not expect to be in contact with infected uh, individuals. Um, also, housing instability serves as a driver of excess cases, COVID cases, but also excess deaths. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here and then talk about some of the applications of uh, this knowledge. So again, um, we see that doubling up increases, uh, increases uh, infections, which is to be expected because it changes the rate of contact um, and the, the rate in which one individual is, is likely to um, infect others in their doubled up household, um, including those not affected by eviction. And also uh, doubling up increases, uh, decreases the effectiveness of uh, stay at home orders, again, due to the types of random contacts that individuals are likely to have. So talking about the applications of this, um, we've um, used this uh, model of a hypothetical um, million uh, person city to then actually understand how some of the different strategies that were that state and local governments were using might influence the future trajectory of the uh, pandemic. And so here's an example of that. Where on the bottom, you see um, our modeled trajectories that have different assumptions around different time phases of the pandemic and different levels of aggression on the part of state or local governments with regards to um, the effectiveness of stay at home orders and anti eviction orders. And what you see in the top are actually the, the actual trajectories of different metro areas in the country with regards to the um, amber line, which is uh, the infection rate and the green line, which is the COVID death rates. So again, what we're able to do here is use the model then to um, you know, understand how um, different uh, metro areas um, have behaved based upon not just the strength of what the local government does, but also the strength of the behavior of the population in those places and how they've actually responded to those orders. We've also spent a lot of time looking at the ways in which uh, evictions may interact with other forms of uh, urban uh, disparity. And so we, we've done this both in kind of a purely computational environment and then also in an empirical one as well. In the computational environment, um, we're actually able to inform differentials in things like the rate of um, the rate of being able to stay home, um, we use data from Cubic to um, estimate uh, for low-income neighborhoods uh, rates of continued contact and mobility outside the home versus uh, for higher-income areas. And we're able to demonstrate that cumulatively. Um, areas with lower socioeconomic status are likely to have a, a greater, a higher cumulative uh, rate of, um, of infection uh, over time. So socioeconomic status uh, does matter. It matters even more, of course, if you are a doubled up uh, individual. We've also applied this uh, modeling strategy um, empirically to uh, data 
on uh, cities like uh, Philadelphia, uh, based upon our uh, local knowledge there and also some other um, efforts there that I'll talk about at the, the end of my talk here. Um, so these are, um, these are uh, just clusters of uh, Philadelphia neighborhoods that are in, informed by uh, sociodemographic factors that do not include race. Um, one of the things that we see though is that these neighborhoods are differentiated by race, even though those are not included in the demographic factors, such as the one in the above table that, um, that uh, constitute the clusters. We also see that those neighborhoods have very different rates of uh, eviction. And um, again, our modeling allows us to see that the consequences then uh, result in massively different differentials with regards to uh, the impacts of COVID on different communities, even within uh, the same city. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about takeaways and then hopefully uh, get into some ways that we're um, hoping to extend uh, this approach. So what we see is that evictions can really significantly increase the infection burden in general, causing, um, by our estimates, um, up to tens of thousands of extra cases. Uh, this impact is expected to be worse in cities where we have growing epidemics or with higher levels of uh, segregation. Um, this is particularly important for us to talk about in this current moment as we're thinking through questions of what do we do with differential vaccination rates, um, both at the city level and also at the state level. Um, evictions do impact all residents, and this is an important argument to be made uh, especially and to share, especially with advocates in thinking about um, how to advocate for um, resources to help disparately impacted communities. Um, we still lack a lot of knowledge around um, how household spread works and thus the precise impact of uh, evictions. And finally, this points to the need for more studies and more data um, on the nature and the characteristics of evicted families, and especially to what happens to families after they experience eviction. And this is one of the things that we're working on through a separate effort to actually construct detailed housing histories for um, households facing housing instability, some of who are likely to face eviction, to be able to track their um, locations over time and understand the meaning of moves that they make and the trade-offs that they make over time and to use that to inform future uh, modeling efforts. So one of the things that I've been thinking about as part of this broader team is um, how we communicate um, um, results from the, this type, these types of modeling efforts, um, both in terms of things like uh, public communications, and we've see, seen our models featured um, in news reports. In this case, um, they're comparing the, um, the clusters that I, I showed you all before with differential vaccination rates, and that's what the, the map with the shades of blue there is showing with the lighter blue being areas with uh, lower vaccination rates, which also tend to be the more um, socioeconomically disadvantaged and racially, racially concentrated uh, portions of the city. And so one of the things that we're thinking about is not just how to disseminate subcomponents of the model to different types of end user groups, especially fair housing advocates, um, also state and local decision makers, and the public more generally, um, but also to think about how we can then use some of the information that they may have to, in turn, think about um, how to refine the model in and of itself. Um, so part of the goal of using CyberGISX and, and um, this, this fellowship is thinking about developing more flexibility within the modeling framework that's going to accept evolving data inputs. Um, we're in a fast moving policy environment. So another piece is thinking about how to accelerate um, the ways in which we can input and uh, input um, information and parameters into the model and then export model results to end users uh, that may be able to use it um, very immediately for decision making. Um, one of the big challenges is um, the demand for that information has been a lot higher than what we've been able to, to furnish. And so we're excited about some of the advances that this is allowing us uh, to make. So with that, I'm going to stop there so that we have time to uh, be in conversation and to uh, talk more collectively about these two projects. So thank you very much for the time. Thanks so much, Andrew. That was, uh, that was wonderful. Um, very uh, stimulating from what you said. Uh, I'm sure uh, folks who are going to take the opportunity to follow up with you. Um, so now this concludes both talks. 
there are some questions from the Q and A box, but uh, also uh, for any uh, attendees, feel free to uh, raise additional questions. Uh, and uh, we would like to have as interactive conversations here as, as possible. I guess questions for both Ruby's team as well as for, uh, for Andrew. I, mean, I see there's one question in chat about um, looking at the clusters and it's seeming like um, some of them may not necessarily be in the black neighborhood. And I'll let Joan talk about that too, but then also um, we'll do some um, research around um, how death was measured if um, people had access, it was 1918 and um, individuals being able to actually get into the official historical record, right? People of color, that may be an issue. Um, Provident Hospital may have, um, their archives may have some information about um, people who didn't fall into the category, but who they feel may have um, been, um, died due to flu or pneumonia. But John, do you want to talk about um, the, the lines that you drew and what they're showing? Yeah, the, the partially the, during the, this total seven weeks of the hospital analysis, maybe the almost 50% of the, the area is the, including the high, high area, is more, other is maybe not significant. One of the reasons is that the black neighborhood is like kind of kind of the boundary of the, the central industrial area in the certain period, especially for the, sometimes the early, sta early stage of the 1980 influenza, that first two weeks is maybe black neighborhood is not initially including those certain, a certain period is not a hospital, but later on there with three and four, five, also they, they are getting a more higher number of the influenza they have. so the maybe some season, the weekly timing of have a uh, association with, but yeah, that right now we also had to more the thinking about, because the obviously black neighborhood is one of the major interest in our research, but also in 1980, 19, uh, 1980, that period, like the other immigrant population also in the certain area and also that area, the hospital area is more the industrial area. So we also have to more the thinking about that, more discuss about the other other factor or other other factor, other environment factor to consider about the, those association. But obviously, the black neighborhood also part of the, the this high high cluster in there. Not not, uh, not all, but the, the, the almost fifty percent of the area is covered. I don't want to butt in, but if I could make a comment here too, I, I also wonder about population density. Um, right. You know, thinking about what we know, especially about the Black Belt in Chicago and kind of the um, overcrowding and you know the intense um, kind of pressure that was put on the housing stock in that that area. So even when we do the overlay between you know the the flu and yeah. the population maps, it may not be conveying the the density that exists. We see the proportion of um, Blacks, but not necessarily the density of that population, which is likely to be much higher than surrounding areas. Yes, yeah, you're right. Definitely. Melina talked about it, right? Like if um, there were several in that area or if the dots overlap, then it would be hard to distinguish mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's a great point. And you're right about the Black Belt. And that's something um, for those who may not know about it, right? So when Blacks started moving, um, migrating, north, um, they were confined to certain neighborhoods regardless of their ability to afford other neighborhoods. And so that was um, called the Black Belt. It's in um, a book, um, Black Metropolis, that kind of breaks it down. Uh, for the 1980 COVID influenza data is based on the count. And the, the COVID map is based on the, the mortality rate, which is the death, number of deaths per population for each of zip code. And maybe, did we put, okay. Yeah, yeah. I just replied to the 
Suhan. Yeah, yeah, and so maybe put um, in maybe cases because you do have the per one thousand on the COVID. Yeah, thank you. Let's see, should I respond to uh, Naomi's uh, question? So um, Naomi is asking uh, about, um, did we find a significant relationship between evictions and the population in, uh, in homeless shelters? And part of the, the challenge, especially since COVID is hit and the moratoria have gone in place is that eviction rates have to a large extent uh, dropped uh, precipitously. Um, not completely, right? The eviction moratoria still doesn't, um, you know, doesn't present prevent everyone from being evicted, but um, you know, it does kind of narrow the circumstances, um, especially around non-payment of rent uh, for which uh, someone can be ev evicted. Um, part of the challenge with the po the population homeless shelter information is just timeliness. Um, um, you know, you can go to individual shelters or sometimes continuum of care may publish data, but for the most part, it's a year on a yearly basis. So it's tough to establish that, um, that uh, relationship in a, a really certain, uh, a really certain way. Um, so we, we haven't been able to kind of model out or look at the statistical relationship between um, evictions and uh, po homeless population. Uh, veteran shelters as of yet. Mm -hmm. So, so I, John, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I, so I, I wanted to ask Ruby's uh, team uh, a, a question. Um, you know, you talked about the role of your youth citizen scientists in this project. And I'm curious to get a sense of what some of the questions are that, that um, working through this mapping process has bought out for them. Are they drawing connections, especially to what's going on in their neighborhoods now, um, as a result of uh, you know working through this um, this geospatial exploration process? I'm just curious what insights they may bring from going through the research process. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know one thing um, that we were trying to determine is um, how how do we define a black neighborhood, right? Or even a predominantly black neighborhood. And even in my dissertation research, I had like several categories. I think it was zero to 30, 31 to maybe 70 or something, and then over 70. And, um, and conceptually, right, I'm thinking, but you even the 30 to 60 something, you still have high levels of blacks there, right? And with the inequality and with the lack of, access. And so even as um, they were um, squarely, all of them in the um, over 50%. And, and I remember thinking, I didn't say that some of, and then I was going to go into my, oh, my dissertation, I'm thinking you still have to think that. So even kind of working with them, I was um, just debating like how, how much do I go into the scientific process? And, and I do try to break down all the steps with them. And, um, and I, and I'll tell you what, what, also, what also comes up to me is that they're really interested in it, right? Like the students who are like showing up for the meetings and um, asking questions and um, showed up to try to digitize it, who are hoping to write the blog. And I just remember at their age, like, um, and I don't know, maybe if someone offered it to me, I would have hit the capacity to do something, but um, it, it's really interesting to see their ability to take in the information, even when um, Becky did the workshop, there was a third grader who um, was working the code, right? Like she was too young to be in the Nobel project, but she was a sibling of one of the students that was working the code and then she got stuck and Becky was able to help her um, find out where she got stuck at. So um, to me, it, it speaks to just capacity. And again, I, I think in some ways we may not, um, give students as, as much 
um, well, exposure to what they to to what they can do, right? If that makes sense. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then John, I see there's one question, right, about summarizing the difference in terms of the relationship between black distribution and influenza and COVID. And, and I think that's probably our next step, but I don't know, do you have any insights having done some of the preliminary analysis? No, actually, the, yes, it yeah. definitely do the next step. We just got the, the system, yeah. yeah initial mapping, so. And it'll be interesting, Andrew, to your point, right, to kind of see how student, what students see, right? Like we'll, and, and again, um, I'll try to hold back what I think and kind of look and listen to what they get from the numbers. And, and I think this is kind of what I'm working through with this project is thinking about, you know, the, you, know, you have a, a pretty complex uh, modeling framework here, but thinking about what are the layers that we may not be thinking about that, um, may, you know, not just inform our understanding of, you know, local conditions and questions of spread, but, um, and also, you know, the effect of policy, but, but, you know, really, yes, thinking, thinking through the policy pieces of the questions, what levers there are to pull, um, that we may not be thinking of, uh, mm -hmm. but that, you know, local knowledge may help to, to fill in there. Yeah, yeah, so and, and a similar thing. It's very different populations and different end users, but yeah. a similar question to how to um, elicit um, elicit grounded feedback and then have a framework that can incorporate it yeah, into I love, research. Mm -hmm. I love when you talk about the grounded feedback and grounded knowledge, which is like the citizen scientists, right? Which is the information that you don't get. So there was another question that I answered, just kind of in the chat, but um, are we also thinking about interviews and other things? And I have another big data project from 1740 to 2014, where we're trying to see what black women have said about their lives. But often um, we talk about how being in the historical record is a privilege, right? Like if they weren't writing, um, we have um, information what white doctors said about black children and said about the mothers, but we don't have the mothers in the historical record. So when you say like this grounded knowledge, that's why I really get excited about citizen scientists, about youth, for them to understand their lived experience is what we as scientists, right? Like um, use to say what we know about the world. And if we don't have a wide range of people adding that knowledge, there are big blind spots that we have and we, we we're thinking of our theories and we're thinking this is the way the world operates, but we're missing key parts of it. So that's what I'm hoping, even the young people starting at this age, um, that it, it could dramatically change what we think we know about science and um, marginalized groups, health and wellness, how do you be resilient during a pandemic, what things will sweep you away, right, in terms of excess death. Um, so. Well, we're right about at the top of the hour. I have a question for Andrew and maybe related to Ruby as well. This is sort of the question connecting to the real world. I found both of your work fascinating because your work is directly touching the real world situations. And Andrew, you were even alluded to the possibility, you know, from your analytical modeling outcome that could be connected to policy uh, changes and uh, decision making. So, could you maybe both elaborate a little bit? You know, how do we learn from your experience and really affect changes uh, into the real world? And what you have gathered from our geospatial fellows program and uh, the cyber GS capabilities uh, now you know. Uh, quite extensively, uh, how could we uh, take extra steps uh, that the work you are pursuing could be uh, more closer to uh, maybe making, I mean, you are already making difference as I understand, but how do we maybe amplify, you know, what you do into, uh, into real world changes? Mm -hmm. 
I, I think my my initial response to your 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 question, my initial thought is, um, it, it's this is and it's not a deep thought. It's just it, it's pretty obvious, right? But the the thing that I'm finding is that the the policy side of this is moving so quickly right now that um, it's as a researcher, it's tough to keep up. Uh, you know, simply because you're trying to make sure you, you know, you have a robust framework, you validate, you're, you know, we're, we're, you're, we're going through a scientific method to, you know, produce the, the models and to, to make sure we have all that stuff buttoned down. Um, but the, the policy questions, the questions we were getting from state governments and from um, housing, fair housing lawyers were, you know, I need an answer. I'm going to court, you know, tomorrow. Can you you know, get me some estimates tomorrow for this bespoke situation. And, um, you know, sometimes the answer was yes. Most of the time it was, I'm sorry, we're just not in a position to, you know, we're not in a position to do that right now until we get this set up. I think now that we're at a point where things are more set up, um, it opens up a new um, and more powerful way to think about how to create interfaces that might allow these different types of end users to um, interface with uh, simplified versions of or the the model. Um, so I, I think you know what I really appreciated about this process is that it does force you to think um, you know think through everything from conceptualization through the potential for a user interface and an opportunity for a non researcher to engage with your you know engage with um, the knowledge that that you've uh, you've produced and uh, so I think for me it's it's forcing me to be more holistic and thinking and in some ways think beyond the publication um, you know think beyond how to share this with other well-informed technically proficient users to make sure that the technological side of things that are um, built in such a way that they also open up potential for these other interfaces and uh, developing uh, digital tools to allow others to work with what we were able to produce. Yeah, and yeah, I love the idea of digital tools and then also um, policy for the people, right? And by the people and that's, um, I think I tried to put a link into a citizen science um, project where um, when COVID first hit, right? We were across the state uh, we talked to homeless individuals and they talked about how the, pandemic was affecting them and for policymakers to have that um, on the ground in real time information as they're developing policy, I think is really critical, um, especially when it comes from um, a wide range of individuals across the state by age, by race, ethnicity, and all of that. And so also a part of the community, this other community health workers project that I'm doing, we have a policy clinic um, it'll be nonpartisan, but we'll work with um, legislators around, first of all, um, there's so many policies coming down now to support individuals and their health and wellness, and just to make sure that vulnerable families know, right, that they know about the child um, care credit, that they know about these other things, but then also when, they, when it hits the ground, how is it working, right? Is it working like you anticipated, or if not, does something else need to be tweaked? So to me, I think, um, Again, the, the information in these relationships are just critical, this back and forth exchange of knowledge and then creating new knowledge. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, both of your insights uh, make tons of sense to me. Um, I think going back to some of the points Ruby made, the importance of democratizing access to the digital tools and capabilities seems to be critical, especially in this fast paced policy yeah. making. Time uh, in a crisis we're in for uh, coping with COVID, uh, but also engagement with the citizens, right? To empower them by having the information readily available for them and to help them understand that their engagement and participation actually matter to the outcome of mm -hmm. policies and um, and I think those two go hand by hand. Uh, yeah, so um, really uh, uh, intrigued by your work. And I think this is uh, uh, so important uh, having the kind of contributions you're making included in part of our geospatial fellows program for, for other fellows to appreciate the 
sort of the importance of linking to the real world is through the kind of uh, unique approaches you're taking. Um, I think we still have some folks um, in the webinar, uh, but I think officially we could adjourn uh, today's webinar. Thanks very much again for um, uh, everyone's participation and specifically uh, another round of applause to uh, both Ruby's team and, uh, and Andrew's uh, wonderful talks. Uh, so um, let's stop the recording. Uh, Colleen, if you could help us and uh, maybe